Hi everyone, Lynn is going to get started. Um, so yeah, so thanks everyone for coming, I do appreciate that. Um, so as you can see, well, so I'm Lynn, and supervisors of David Tejera, Arnaud uh, Chaya, and Adam Masses, and I am studying for my PhD, uh, the oceans within uh, icy moons. And uh, what we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about in today's talk is nutrient transport in the subsurface ocean of Enceladus, which is pictured here. Um, so probably quite a bit to unpack. So I thought I would start with just a more wider perspective. So this is a figure and I'm showing this because I think it really nicely illustrates the uh, diversity and abundance of uh, worlds in our solar system other than the planets. Um, so we hear quite a bit about the, the major eight planets of our solar system, uh, but there's a, a bunch of other worlds that do exist. And here is a two scale collage of a lot of them. And most these are mostly moons. Uh, the exception to that is Pluto, uh, which we you know is a dwarf planet. And these are mostly icy moons, the moons where water ice form a significant proportion of their bulk composition. And I guess the exception to that would be uh, Earth's moon and uh, Jupiter's innermost moon, Io, which is pictured here, because Io is a volcanic moon. It's actually the only other place in the solar system other than Earth where we have observed active sort of volcanism occurring on its surface. And there, yeah, there's a, there's a wide variety here. So we have uh, the Titan, for example, like has an atmosphere that's uh, denser than Earth's. So, um, and yeah, many interesting moons, but the moons that I'm particularly interested in are the moons that are highlighted in blue. And well, what does this mean? Well, these are the moons where our observations imply that underneath the icy exteriors uh, lie globally distributed deep oceans of liquid water. So we have uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So these orbit Jupiter. And then we have Titan and Enceladus, uh, which orbit Saturn. And just like before I go on, like it's worth noting that just because these other moons are highlighted in white, uh, does not mean that we don't think that these uh, have subsurface oceans as well. It's simply because we don't have the evidence to imply that yet. And there's a reason for that, and that's because uh, Jupiter and Saturn have both had their own dedicated orbit emissions. We have the Galileo probe that was the Jupiter in the mid 1990s and early 2000s, and they gathered the evidence we needed to imply the presence of subsurface oceans within its means. And we had the Cassini probe, which orbited Saturn uh, from the mid 2000s to the late 2010s, and it gathered the evidence we needed to imply the presence of subsurface oceans within Titan and Enceladus. And in contrast, Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Pluto, these systems have only been visited once. In fact, Neptune and Uranus, that was all the way back in the 1980s, was a single flyby by the Voyager 2 probe, and it, it flew by at a, at a distance. And it's thought that uh, some of the moons of Uranus could be good candidates uh, for having subsurface oceans, particularly Ariel and Miranda. And, and it's been shown that um, a single flyby can uh, be enough to gather the evidence we need to confirm the existence of subsurface oceans within them if they do exist. Um, and I guess just the point of all this is just to illustrate that, that oceans exist in our solar system in, in places other than Earth, in multiple places, in fact, and um, ocean worlds could well be abundant. Um, but for today's talk, we're just going to focus on one, and that's uh, this one here, the small icy moon of Enceladus, moon of Saturn. So, so if we zoom in on Enceladus a bit, because hopefully as you can see from the previous diagram, it is it was very small, it's 252 kilometers in radius, so it would fit within the size of the UK. Um, it's, it's, it's actually one of the whitest bodies in the solar system. It uh, reflects nearly all of the instant radiation on it, so it suggests a very young geologically active surface. And but what makes Enceladus so significant is, of course, its um, possession of a globally distributed deep ocean of liquid water. And I guess some of you might wonder, like, how do we actually know that? Well, there's actually like multiple lines of evidence that kind of were pieced together over the Cassini mission. Uh, but perhaps the most compelling line of evidence is uh, something called libration. I might just very quickly detail that. That's all right. So um, what we have here is an artist's impression of Saturn. 
and Enceladus. And so Enceladus is what we call tidally locked to Saturn. So that means that the uh, same side of Enceladus faces Saturn uh, all of the time was kind of locked uh, in this kind of like stare down of Saturn. Um, but actually, what you also get um, is a slight oscillations about this equilibrium. Uh, these are called vibrations. So it's like a rocking motion. It's like as if Enceladus is kind of shaking its head at Saturn as it moves around. And uh, these uh, vibrations are actually really, really small. So like the amplitude is really only about a, a couple of hundred meters, um, but it, that has been observed and we can observe that. And we found that those rocking motions, those vibrations are about an order of magnitude too large for uh, an object whose icy shell is a kind of rigidly attached to the core inside. And what that suggests is that there must be an intermediate layer separating the ice from a rock. And that intermediate layer must therefore be globally distributed. And we think of that is the ocean of liquid water. And now, uh, just another reason why I'm, I'm kind of sharing this in detail is because this movement of the ice shell over the water does have uh, implications for the mixing in the ocean. And we'll return to that later, uh, maybe for the next slide. Um, but of course, we're talking about lines of evidence. And I think really kind of the most striking line of evidence on a cell list for a subsurface ocean are these. These are plumes, uh, like guys are like, like jets of water vapor that emanate out of Enceladus's South Polar region. And uh, we first saw these, discovered these with, when Cassini visit, first arrived at the Saturn system in 2004. We saw um, it was actually in the mag yeah, magnetic kind of data. We saw like these kind of magnetic field lines kind of extending out away from Enceladus, like almost like a comet free tail. Um, but it turned out that we could ex the Cassini mission got extended. And so we definitely fly the probe right through the plumes. And this allowed us to gain direct samples of its ocean and its ocean composition. The first time we could uh, sample the composition of an ocean other than Earth's. And I guess, well, the question is, what did we find? And uh, well, we found many of the things. We found many of the essential chemical elements for life, and many of the essential building blocks for life. Um, and kind of a composition that's like relatively similar to Earth's. Um, and this is quite promising and, uh, because of course we know that uh, well, liquid water, uh, essential chemical elements are some of the key ingredients for life. But another very significant discovery we made uh, uh, was uh, the detection of hydrosilica nanoparticles. So let's just um, dissect that a little bit. So we have hydro, we have which is water, we have silica, which is rock. And what these particles, what this suggests is that there must be some reaction occurring at cellulose of depth at high temperature between water and rock. And that um, suggests that there is some sort of submarine hydrothermalism or hydrothermal activity occurring at, uh, in, at the depths of Enceladus's ocean. And this is, well, particularly uh, a particularly intriguing discovery because we know uh, that similar physical environments uh, at the bottom of Earth's oceans have sustained ecosystems for hundreds of millions of years, completely uh, independently of the sun. Um, uh, is, there any, is there another bit to that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so this really has kind of placed and sold us at the forefront of the search for extraterrestrial life because we have liquid water, we have some of the essential chemical elements, and now we have a potential energy source as well. And um, so there's not really going to be a mission going back to Enceladus for a long time now, um, probably not for another couple of decades. But um, in the most recent NASA decadal survey, um, the third highest priority prioritized mission uh, is something called the Enceladus Orbilander. So there is um, some desire to return to Enceladus. And this is what this uh, probe will, would do if it gets funded. And it's the third highest priority. So it has a decent chance, um, but what it would do is it would uh, go back to Enceladus and actually go into orbit about Enceladus and then eventually land upon its surface in the South Korea region and search for signs of life. Um, but yeah, but that kind of brings us on to like what I'm interested in, which is uh, the ocean circulation of Enceladus, kind of its dynamics and how it moves. And 
Um, well, why am I interested in that? Well, it's really because and so this is we know that uh, these nutrients exist in Enceladus' ocean because we found them in the samples. Um, but what we don't really know is like how those nutrients are distributed in this ocean and how they're transported from the bottom of Enceladus' ocean, where for all we know life could exist, um, to like the South Polar region, which we can probe. And there's been a lot of work that has been done analyzing these plume samples, but there's been comparably little actually looking into how those uh, nutrients get from Enceladus's ocean bottom to its surface. And uh, we think that that's quite a gap. Uh, and so I guess an example of some of that work that has been done is, uh, so by a paper uh, by Stu et al. Um, and what they did was that they, uh, they looked at the plume samples, they looked at uh, the hydrosilicon nanoparticles, and from that, so quite remarkably, actually, they're able to estimate um, like how long um, it took for those hydrosilicon particles to get from the bottom of Enceladus' ocean uh, to the plumes where it was eventually ejected out into space. And they estimated that time scale to be months to several years at most. So quite fast. And I guess the question that we want to ask is, well, is this consistent with um, Enceladus' ocean circulation? Can Enceladus' ocean circulation transport nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to the top in like that, that, that amount of time? And, um, and, and, and under what parameter space is that achievable? Um, and that's kind of going to be the focus of just this talk. Uh, yeah, that's going to be the focus of this talk. And I guess the take home message um, it's somewhat complicated, uh, but the role of the saltiness of Enceladus' ocean cannot be neglected. Uh, so, yes. But I guess before we do all that, um, maybe it's, there is, there are some important differences between, um, well, I guess, sorry, no, the first thing we need to ask is, um, okay, how do we actually go about, uh, like, figuring out how until this is ocean actually circulates, right? Like, how do we do that? Um, and the answer is, uh, ocean, the ocean general circulation model. So these are uh, general circulation models to, that we use to simulate uh, the dynamics of Earth's oceans at varying spatial scales. And we know that Enceladus um, well, it has a liquid water ocean and it obeys kind of the same fundamental laws of physics as you know, a, a fluid moving in Earth's oceans would also obey. So we can model Enceladus's ocean using uh, an ocean circulation model like the ones that we use for climate change simulations, for example, but with a few tweaks, because Enceladus is not Earth, there's, there's some differences that we, some very important differences that we need to consider. And so I just thought it'd be good to just go through some of those very briefly. Like what makes an Enceladus different to Earth that could significantly change how this ocean circulates? And so I think there are two fundamental differences, I think, between Enceladus' ocean and Earth's ocean. So the first of those is that Enceladus' ocean is substantially deeper than Earth's. It's at least probably about 10 times as deep as Earth's. And unlike Earth, where you have these kind of continents that break up the ocean, um, we have no evidence to suggest that such continents exist on Enceladus. It's, there may well be a little bit of variation in its bottom topography, but so far our, our gravity observations don't suggest that there is barriers like continents that kind of break up uh, kind of, yeah, kind of separate its ocean out into little sections. And so therefore, yeah, we, we don't have that. Um, and so on Earth, these continents like, play a crucial role in, 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 our, in, in our ocean circulation. And so that's going to, um, that's going to yeah, lead to a different ocean circulation regime. And there's also a few approximations that we need to relax because of how deep Enceladus' ocean is relative uh, to uh, its size. So we make this approximation with the hydrostatic approximation usually on Earth and on Celsius. We don't think that this is completely accurate. So we relax that. Um, so that's the first difference. And then the second key difference is that Enceladus has a big, thick layer of ice covering it, whereas Earth does not. <laughs> and that has uh, some important effects. So firstly is that um, there is no wind-driven circulation on Enceladus. That may seem a little bit obvious, but 
the wind driven circulation is, is a fun, well, wind is a fundamental driver of the ocean on Earth. And so, um, Enceladus's ocean circuit, but and not having that means that I guess the, the energy input into Enceladus's ocean is going to be substantially less. Um, and that's going to have important implications to the bigger of its circulation. Um, and another implication of this is that the temperature at the top of Enceladus Ocean, so this ice ocean boundary, is going to be near homogenous or near isothermal, you could call it. Um, only very small variations owing to uh, variations uh, in the freezing point because the temperature at the ice ocean interface will be at the freezing point of water, and you get small variations owing to changes uh, in uh, pressure, as it was called today changes in the thickness of the ice shell and that's a complete contrast to earth as well because on earth we have you know a very warm uh, equatorial region and like uh, like tens of degrees warmer at the surface compared to the poles but on the cell list, you're looking at differences of more like 0.1 degree and once again that has implications for energy input into its ocean um but yeah uh, yeah i think so but yeah we mentioned uh some, some thickness variations so this is another thing that we actually have observed uh, we know that Enceladus's ice is thicker at the equator and thinner at the poles. So thinner at the poles, thicker at the equator. And from this, because we know, well, from our observations, we're pretty sure that Enceladus's ice shell is in a steady state. So what that means is that the thickness of its ice is not changing, it's staying the same. So it's, if from that, because we know its thickness is staying the same, we can guess that there must be freezing occurring near its equator and melting occurring nearer and so this is false. And that I will just go into that very briefly just to explain why that is the case. Just with another artist impression of and so this is ice sheet, it, it doesn't go to zero at the poles. It's just like I can't roll that diagrams. <laughs> But yeah, but what will happen? So when you have a, an ice thickness gradient, so over long time scales, ice acts like a fluid. So um, you can imagine, like, you know, if you pull like you have like a pile of gold and stir, it's going to flow down right from the, from the from the top to the bottom. And over long time scales, uh, ice will do the same thing. It flows down its pressure gradient from where it's thick to where it's thin. And, but if we want to maintain uh, this thickness. Uh, despite this flow of ice, we want to keep the thickness the same, then, uh, well, it, sorry, if the thickness is staying the same, it would suggest that there must be some process acting to replenish the ice that is flowing away from the equator. And that process is freezing, but the ice shell, that's the only process that could act to replenish the ice. And similarly, because the ice at and the pole is not melting away to nothing, it's still staying the same thickness, but we have, um, Sorry, but sorry, is but sorry, let me explain that again. <laughs> because the ice at the poles is uh, staying the same thickness, it's not homogenizing, but still the thickness gradient is being maintained. It suggests that there is some process um, eating, chipping away at that thickness to enable it to remain thinner than the ice at the equator. And therefore, that suggests that the melting of the ice shell is likely occurring at the poles. And so, and we can actually um, estimate uh, these rates of freezing and melting by estimating uh, the flow rates of the ice given its observed ice thickness profile. Uh, we can use that to estimate the flow rates and then use that to estimate what freezing and melting rates are necessary to maintain that uh, equilibrium thickness. And uh, I just got a very, just very quickly plotted. Uh, just if you plot the freezing rate against the latitude, you see that at the equator, which is at the middle, you get freezing, and at the poles, which is uh, yeah, either side here, you get uh, a negative value, which indicates uh, melting. Um, and so we indeed get uh, freezing at the equator, melting at the poles, um, which is another kind of key uh, component to Enceladus's ocean circulation that will be important later. Uh, but the final critical component, I would say, is uh, uh, some geothermal heating. So, uh, so there's a process called tidal heating, which acts to warm and sell this as core. And what this does, uh, this heat will then move outward from the core into the ocean 
and as a geothermal heat flux and heat it from below. And this is important. Um, just, I do have a very quick primer on what tidal heating is if people are a little bit unsure. And sorry if I'm rushing through this too fast, let me know if I'm, if I'm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so tidal heating, of uh, what it is, it's just a, a way that Enceladus is heated through its gravitational interaction with Saturn. So in a perfectly circular orbit, uh, so, uh, well, yeah, in a perfectly circular orbit, um, so tidal heating is due to the difference in gravity uh, between the side closest to the planet and the side furthest away. So we know that gravity scales with distance away from objects, so the gravity at the side closest is going to be stronger than the gravity at the side further away. Um, and so what that does is it acts to stretch the moon all the same, or in this case, Enceladus. Um, but because this stretching is constant around its orbit, um, that doesn't really do anything. It doesn't act to uh, impart energy into the system. But um, it's not out like yet, unfortunately. <laughs> but when uh, the orbit is eccentric, what happens is that that distance uh, between the moon and the planet, it varies. And what happens, and what that means is that that stretching varies with the orbit. It, you get greater stretching as you get closer, and that difference in gravity gets stronger, and you get a kind of contraction uh, when you're further away. And what this does is it acts kind of periodically, kind of uh, squeeze and uh, contract Enceladus. And, and this, this heats it up, this imparts kinetic energy into the system and heats up. Um, this heat goes into Enceladus's core and its ice, um, and this uh, yeah acts to um, heat up its core um, and also acts to create some of the uh, thickness gradients that we, we are observing in the Enceladus's ice shell, and that is uh, an, another important part of the social circulation. So, uh, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so. We've gone through some of the key ways in which Enceladus' ocean is different. Uh, so we, what we know is that it's geothermally heated at the bottom, and we have uh, models which give us the uh, estimates of values of that. We know ice is at the top, and we can estimate melting and freezing rates from the uh, ice thickness profiles and temperature from that as well. Uh, we roughly know its ocean depth, and there are a bunch of various other planetary parameters, which we also know, and these are other things that we need to change so that we can model Enceladus, and that's what they've done. And then, but there are some uncertain things which will also affect its ocean circulation. And these are things that we're going to explore. So we know from the flume samples that salty nuts is roughly between 20, and, no, 2 and 40 grams per kilogram, uh, which uh, for reference, Earth's ocean is about 35 grams per kilogram. Um, so there's quite a big range of uncertainty, but, um, and then another, uh, process which is uncertain is something called turbulent mixing. So, what is the effect of that uh, liberating ice shell um, and on 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 the ocean circulation? What's the effect of tidal mixing on the ocean circulation? And the magnitude of uh, these forcings is also uncertain. And so, so of course, the general approach uh, that I've been taking is uh, implement what we know. And then exploring the uncertainty to what we don't know. And that's uh, what, what, we, what we're about to do. So we so hopefully I haven't like lost you from all that. <laughs> um, but now we're actually getting on to some results. So hopefully, <laughs> um, yeah, things will get a bit more interesting. Um, so what I'm going to show you now are some tracer simulations. So uh, tracer is just another word we use for nutrients. So it's just something you can track in the oceans. These are nutrients we can track in the ocean. Um, and so we, we, we choose um, a two-dimensional version of our model set up to keep uh, computational costs manageable. So it's in latitude and depth. Um, it extends a pole-to-pole fairly -pole <laughs> uh, coarse resolution of one degree. And we perform two tracer simulations uh, here. Um, so what this involves is you have a you restore the concentration of a tracer uh, to a constant value at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then once you let the simulation go, then that tracer can be transported by the ocean circulation, and we can see where the tracer goes. And we do this for two different uh, bulk 
salinity values of the ocean. So it's solving that. So we, we choose an Earth like solving up of 35. That's all that's another pretty much grams per kilogram. And then we choose a much fresher uh, uh, salinity saltiness value of 8.5 practical salinity units, which is also pretty much grams per kilogram. And yeah, we just see where the traces go. And the reason why I've chosen these two different salinities will become apparent in just a moment. So let's have a look. So yeah, so what we have here, so we have our fresh uh, simulation, we have our salt yeah, simulation, and we have our time sim elapsed. And what you can hopefully immediately see is that there is a stark contrast in the future. So we can see that in the saltier simulation, uh, the trace, the nutrients need to rise pretty rapidly to about halfway through the ocean by about five years. Um, whereas in the fresh simulation, pretty much nothing is happening, um, which is which is interesting. Um, so you can see that in about seven years, uh, the traces do kind of touch base at the uh, equator here and, and reach the ice shell. Um, at the poles, they kind of get a bit stuck, and the reason for that. Is because of those ice shell effects that I mentioned earlier. So remember um, how we said that there's a freezing occurring at the equator, and so you get a rejection, you get input of brine and salt into the water, and this acts to destabilize the water column and create convection, which allows uh, the trace to rise to the surface. Um, in contrast, at the poles, uh, we have melting, and what that does is it, it, it creates a fresher, uh, more buoyant layer of water. It kind of sits, sits at the poles and acts to prevent uh, those nutrients from, from moving upwards. Um, and yeah, I guess if we then uh, take a look at uh, just how uh, everything looks at the end. So this is the trace concentration once again, which is plotted at the end of those 10 years. And I guess once again, just really see there is really, there's a stark contrast, right? Um, yeah, in the pressure simulation, those traces are pretty much, and nutrients are pretty much gone nowhere. Um, but in the saltier simulation, uh, like I said, uh, getting heated somewhat at poles, uh, but they do rise up at the equator after 10 years. And I think there's the next one like fast forwarding to a thousand years, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, so after so we fast forward that trace simulation a lot more. Um, and what we find is that uh, those uh, in the saltier simulation, the nutrients, they, they rise, they, they get to the top at the poles. But in the pressure simulation, they still really have not made much headway towards the surface. And, and I guess just have this here, just kind of keep in the back of your mind um, the observations that we're comparing to here. And there's a reason, and yes, and yeah, the reason why the, they're, getting, they're taking so long to get to the surface is. is well, one of the reasons is because of how deep and so this ocean is. So it's trying to diffuse. I, th I think this is the wrong order around, but I think that's okay. Um, but yeah, I think no, that's fine. Um, but yeah, but the reason is because it's very clear that in the salty solution, the ocean is convecting, and so the nutrients are transported quite quickly. Um, whereas in the fracture ocean, they're not convecting. Convection is not occurring, and instead, that means that the process it relies upon to get those nutrients from the bottom to the top is diffusion. And well, we know that diffusion is a much less efficient process than convection. And you, you can actually estimate how long it will take the nutrients to diffuse from the bottom to the top of Enceladus's ocean uh, using an estimate of its ocean depth and uh, about the, the diffusivity value. And just because of how deep Enceladus's ocean is, that, that, that amount of time is tens of thousands of years. So that depth really really acts, acts against uh, the fast the transport time scales. Um, and so I guess this begs the question, like why is such a contrast? I've just changed this uh, salinity value. That's what we've changed. Why is there such a contrast between the nutrient transport between these two simulations? And to answer that question, what I've got plotted here is water density as a function of salinity, saltiness, and temperature. And what I want you to focus on here is the slope. Uh, so these are slopes of the water density, lines of concrete density, and how they slope in different directions between salty and fresh. What does this mean? Well, 
for a salty setup, we can see that at low temperatures and a higher saltiness value, that as you increase the temperature of a fluid, you get a reduction in density. So the, wa the water becomes more point. And that kind of makes sense, right? That's what happens in the atmosphere when you heat, uh, I guess, air, it rises. And that kind of makes sense. But in this pressure scenario, we have uh, an interesting scenario where as we increase the temperature, we actually get an increase in density at low temperatures. That's uh, so it just becomes less buoyant. And that seems a little counterintuitive to us, right? Um, but there are examples of uh, this type of behavior on Earth in uh, the form of freshwater environments in lakes and ponds. It's one of the reasons why uh, you see ice form more easily on uh, ponds, for example, compared to the sea, is because uh, that's a fresher water environment. And what happens is that in winter, it gets cooled from the top, and that cooling makes the water more buoyant, and so it stays there. You get a feedback loop where the water continuously gets more get some cold and eventually freezes over. Um, whereas um, in, in the ocean, for example, if you cool from above because of um, this relationship instead, that just has to kind of overturn the ocean. Um, and yeah, you get the same behavior. And if we take a look at some temperature plots, um, you can see this effect. So uh, for the fresh simulation here, we have, remember, uh, warming from below and cooling from above. And this actually acts to, so this in the salty solution acts to destabilize the columns. So what happens if you get convection occurring all the way through the ocean because um, of the cooling from the top and warming from below. But in the fresh solution, this actually acts to stabilize the solution and so it completely stifles convection. Um, and so the only way that the heat can tra be transported up is, is through diffusion. Um, and yeah, this is quite a, an interesting behavior that, of course, we don't see in Earth's oceans because Earth's oceans are at a higher salinity and in this region of values. Um, also, note the temperatures here. Uh, this is going to be important for a little bit. And note how this behavior only occurs at very low temperatures. If this was, say, 30 degrees, uh, the behavior would, would actually return to uh, the behavior we see in a salty uh, regime all of the time. Uh, it's just at, and it would yeah, cut off this behavior, but at low temperatures, we see this interesting behavior. Um, and that's important for the next bit because we mentioned, yeah. Um, so that's our first uncertainty, right? But there's more uncertainty. Uh, there's so much uncertainty. <laughs> um, but there's the other uncertainty that I mentioned is something called turbulent mixing. And so turbulent mixing are processes that allow that kind of push water downwards against the stable stratification. So you can push it down when it doesn't want to go down. Um, and this is, and in Earth, so an example of this could be like the winds, for example. Um, but of course, we don't have those in the solar. So dominant processes of turbulent mixing will probably be that vibration that I showed you earlier. Um, but the thing is, is that we really don't know. Uh, well, the uncertainty and magnitude of that mixing associated with that vibration is not known, and it is varied by orders of magnitude. Um, and so the way we parameterize uh, turbulent mixing in ocean, uh, global ocean models typically is using a uh, vertical diffusivity value, KB. Um, and as I said, like that value is very uncertain. And what I did just now is I chose a higher value. So, um, which would be for stronger mixing. Um, but I guess, but of course, the diffusivity could be substantially lower. And so I guess the question is uh, what happens if you choose a lower value? Um, and I guess the reason why I bring this up is because um, remember how this is the salty uh, simulation from earlier and the temperature outputs. And what you can see is that you get these uh, more buoyant regions comparing to the poles because, as I said, there is melting there. Um, and uh, what we can see is that if you change uh, the value of turbulent mixing, uh, these regions also change. Uh, this represents the surface way that gets pushed down by that turbulent mixing. Um, and yeah, we go to the next one. Um, 
And so what I've got plotted here now, uh, so we form the trace simulations again, just kind of fast forwarded uh, to the end, it's no animation this time, uh, but we have uh, salty uh, solutions and the pressure 8.5 solution. So same salinity choices from before, but we have a stronger diffusivity. So this is what we have before. So these are the two plots that you've seen already. And we have a weaker diffusivity. Uh, so these plots you haven't seen already. And uh, what you find, so in the salty solution, those uh, nutrients can get much closer to the poles by the end of those, uh, those 10 years. And the reason for that is because of now that the turbulent mixing processes are weaker, uh, what that means is that that surface layer, that surface stratified layer is not pushed down as much. It, it's much more confined nearer to the surface. And that means that these nutrients can convect much more closely and get much closer to that surface. So that's what we see in the salty solution. In the fresh solution, interestingly, um, we kind of had a change of fortune. And actually now the, now the nutrients have actually decided that they can get quite close to the height. <laughs> and that's quite interesting, right? So um, why has that happened? And now to answer that question, so remember how I said about how that behavior only occurs when the temperature is low enough. And so if we take a look at our temperature anomaly, and note the color bars scale different here. Um, what happens is that in the weaker mixing, uh, scenario, uh, the like that the fusivity is is so low that um, the, so what happens here is the, the heat can diffuse up somewhat because um, that the diffusivity is high enough. What happens in the uh, low diffusivity is the heat uh, the diffusivity is too weak, so the heat doesn't diffuse up, so it just builds up and builds up until eventually it gets so warm that that anomalous behavior that I was mentioning earlier um, it gets um, cast it. It, that gets removed. And so you get more of a kind of a, in this bottom warm region, we get behavior more akin to that salty solution, which I showed you. And as a result, so we get a, a convective region that's um, uh, where nutrients can get much closer to the ice shell. And just, just for sanity's sake, if you plot um, where the, well, <laughs> this is the proportion of the time that convection is happening in the model. And um, well, you can see that, of course, <laughs> uh, convecting at, uh, Low turbulent mixing and uh, in pretty much all of the model, except like right at the surface, but that doesn't matter because the nutrients don't get that um, in this higher mixing value. Um, yeah, no convection. And yeah, and just to show the tracer simulation uh, results one last time, so these are the same graphs we saw earlier. And yeah, that also has a very major effect on uh, where the tracers can, uh, nutrients can get to. And so that kind of leads into these conclusions, right? So what we can see is that um, on the time scales that have been suggested by the study, it out, um, it's really only convection as a process that can get the nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to the top in such time scales. And so that means that for these time scales to be achievable, uh, we need a convective layer that can get as close to, uh, I guess, the Enceladus surface as possible. And so that kind of rules out um, and so, sorry, let's, let's just say we take that the base and that's the truth, um, and that it is the ocean that is transporting those nutrients, then it kind of rules up that, that, that whole regime that I showed you of high mixing and a, and a pressure simulation. And yeah, just summarize here, like generally, like a lower turbulent mixing um, and cell dust is most conducive to time scales estimate, estimated by the study and the salty as well. Um, and that is pretty much what I just said. Um, but it is possible that um, there could be an alternative explanation for uh, the observations, these observations. For example, there could be an alternative process perhaps that transports these nutrients from the ocean bottom to the ocean top. So for example, a gas bubble transport maybe. Um, and if that is the case, and it is confirmed unequivocally that um, Enceladus' ocean is in that higher turbulent mixing regime, and this ocean is fresh, then that would suggest that, in fact, Enceladus the ocean bottom is well rich with nutrients because the nutrients uh, rise so slowly. And it would therefore suggest that concentrations of nutrients in Enceladus, Enceladus the ocean bottom uh, would far exceed those that we have estimated from group samples. Um, and that, I think, is, is it. So, yeah, thanks everyone for listening.
Do we have any questions? Yeah. So you basically you modelled the ocean as flat on the bottom. Yes. And flat at the top. Well, nearly flat at the top. Yes. What effect would not being flat? I mean, you know it doesn't. It's not got walls. Yeah. Like the Earth has. Yeah. But what effect would a bit of a wall, a sort of a line of bricks have? Uh, you know, I mean, if you've got a 40 kilometre deep, one imagines you could still have a five kilometre mountain, which would be pretty big on the Earth's surface. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But if you had one in there, what effect would it have? Would it make any difference to your mixing? Uh, I can imagine it would definitely have some effect. Um, I think, I guess one of the problems with the approach currently is that the mixing is uh, like parameterized rather than actually um, like explicitly resolved. So in that sense, I guess, um, it, yeah, because I'm not explicitly resolving uh, the kind of the, the mixing from like the the, the waves from the, the tides. So it wouldn't have, yeah, so I think I'll have to try and find another way to actually account for that and maybe figure out how to model that explicitly. Um, I think that would definitely have some effects in terms of introducing some asymmetry into the solution. You have to go 3D, of course. Well, exactly, yeah. And that's kind of, um, yeah, that's a, a future step. Um, Yes, um, but yeah, that would definitely introduce, yeah, I think the asymmetry and then the kind of the, the eddies that would kind of get reduced, I think, would, would have an effect. Although I think overall, like, these conclusions are still, I think they're still, they would still hold. In the, I think if you had massive walls, maybe they wouldn't, but you know yeah. they're not there. So, yeah. 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 Have you considered the boundary conditions between the, uh, the ice and the water? The ice and the massive volume, one sliding over the other, that's going to produce effects that you may not know about or yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, because for example, like one, I guess one example could be like those plumes themselves, like that in itself, the plume forming mechanism could generate some mix and we could get some of those jets of water. That's a good point. Um, I haven't thought too much about that, to be honest. Yes. Um, other than that, I can imagine that mixing just generally out the ice shell is probably going to be much larger than it is elsewhere. I can imagine, because what I've done right now uh, in these simulations is I've just, I've parameterized it as a uniform value. And I think that's probably under, a little unrealistic. I think it's probably going to be much larger at the ice shell because of the effects that you've mentioned. And that's also a future step as well to kind of explore that sensitivity. Um, but I think once again, in terms of, um, I think that might kind of give a bit of a, a helping hand. So remember how we saw how um, some of the solutions, they're getting very close to the top of the poles, but not quite reaching it. And I think that it's those types of processes that would give that helping hand to kind of get it get it to the top. Um, yeah, I think maybe. What other? I mean, you, you mentioned some values of salinity. Yeah. OK. Um, and obviously, some of those salinity values came from satellite measurements, did they? By the uh, so, so yeah, so they came from. Uh, so actually, so one thing I forgot to mention was that uh, we sampled themselves as plumes, uh, but also um, the what the E ring of Saturn. So Saturn has many rings, a letter, um, and the E ring is actually formed from uh, the material that is ejected out of Saturn's plume. So what we've actually done is we've actually taken samples of that, and that is actually where we've got the salinity uh, estimates from. Um, okay, part B to that question, comment or question, yeah. was um, some temperature values, because I think some of this convection is controlled by mm -hmm. the temperature of, well, we know the temperature of the ice, but mm -hmm. certainly the convective uh, effects will be driven by energy, i.e. temperature, yeah. from the top to the bottom, whether that's linear or not, and it's likely that it isn't because of the perturbations. But, so if you could get a handle on energy values in terms of real energy, how many joules, for example, mm -hmm. that's driving this process, Mm -hmm. I think that will help some of your conclusions mm -hmm. and also the model because mm -hmm. if you can put energy in, yeah. you can better estimate um, your your conclusions uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. After all, this is an energy model that you're looking at. It's a, as almost a CFD, CFD type. 
Uh, yeah, it's it's like yeah, kind of global fluid dynamic, yeah, yeah like model. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and yeah, to be fair, uh, so for the geothermal heating, I've used at the bottom. Uh, that is actually from a, a study that has uh, estimated okay. uh, heating. Yeah, um, but uh, it's a good point because um, so we also think some of that heating also occurs in the ice as well, and that's gonna some of that heat will will find its way into the ocean, but that is actually something we're quite uncertain about. You know? Yeah. How even do you think the heating from below really would be? I mean, like Earth's heating from below, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a little geothermal activity. Yeah. And it's not exactly very even, but yeah. you know, famously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, do we expect it to be? That, that's a very good point. Um, so the answer is no, it's, it's not that even. And so what I didn't show is that actually, well, firstly, we expect on average, um, the bottom heating to be polar amplified, so it's higher at the poles compared to the equator. And that's one of the reasons why we think that there's a thinner ice shell at the poles versus the equator, because of that tidal heating is stronger there. Um, but you're also right, I think one study I, I saw shows that um, you, you get actually some like very concentrated regions of this um, like um, yeah, geothermal heating associated with um, some of these hydrothermal systems. And I think the problem with this 2D setup is that you can't, because these are like variations in the zonal, you can't really, um, but you can't go a thousand years into the future 3D in a sensible time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the dream, the dream. But, um, but yeah, um, I, I think, yeah, that would be very interesting to see what the effects um, of that on trees. It made me think, however, that you were saying that you're not that high resolution because you're only using one degree, but of course one degree when you're, yeah, planet's only 250 kilometer radius, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's, I mean, yeah, it's about it's an awful lot smaller than one degree is on Earth. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's about uh, about in latitude, it's about four kilometers. So yeah, uh, but in longitude, it gets very small. It falls like tens of meters, to, which makes it a real like computational challenge. Yes. Is there any evidence about the geothermal activity, such as uh, volcanicity or other gases? Um, so as far as I'm aware, I haven't heard of any of okay. it. Because that will affect, obviously, the function of the Yeah, yeah. The dynamics. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, what are your future future projects, future works? Future How works. are you going to keep going with your project? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Um, so there's definitely more to explore here. Um, so I kind of touched on eddies earlier. Um, that's something that um, that I don't think I, I, I in these simulations here um, we're not like fully representing. We're kind of I was very crudely representing them. Um, but recently I've been doing some work where I've been using a parameterization scheme that's used in Earth ocean modeling for the what's called a Gentleman Williams, and I, I relaxed some approximations in that which we made on Earth to make it valid for um, an, an ocean like Enceladus um, and just doing some work to try and see what effects that has. Um, but um, I think right now, I think I think the, the plan that I think me and David kind of up was just to um, consolidate kind of what we have um, and kind of think of a way forward because uh, like we're discussing, like um, and we can imagine that going 3D, for example, would have a significant effect, um, but um, that also has like some severe computational challenges. So it's kind of this, yeah, kind of decide. Right. Um, I've just checked seeing is uh, I've just checked if there's any questions online. Um, any questions? Feel free to ask in the chat. Um, I'll read them out. So uh, okay, let me ask a really awkward question then. So what, how likely do you think there is stuff alive down there? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. So it's difficult. If there is something, it would only, I think it would only be very kind of simple, like life, like kind of single cell, yeah. kind of stuff. Um, that's really difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's an impossible question. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I, I kind of hope for it. Yeah, I hope for it. Um, it's because basically, if we find out that, if, there, if we find that there's life in Enceladus, then that is a pretty good indicator that life that's is everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. And I think that's just like such a big question. I just feel like like surely like there is like a rational way that life kind of like develops. And if that is the case, it seems to have all of the right ingredients that yeah. everything we know about the earth and where everywhere we know has life, it has the same ingredients. So you'd like to think 
Yeah, more or less, more or less. But yeah. But as you say, if it's that close to home, yeah, it probably is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And people are starting to develop uh, missions to yeah. trade up all yeah. through the eyes. I'm, I'm not sure we still be alive. You, you might, you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you three. Sorry. It's partly answered by uh, the, the missions to Mars. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the theory now is that the atmosphere was stripped away. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, a long time yeah. ago, there was life there. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing now is like an Earth could be in. X million years time, mm -hmm. and you like you may find that um, there's something similar here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a question of uh, what stage is that? Has it gone? Yeah, is it coming? Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah, it's the great filters. Are we before one or after one? And we don't know. And that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point because life also needs time to develop. And another thing yes. is that we don't know exactly how long the solar system has been there. We think probably it could be a couple of hundred million years, but as far as I know, I think it's really not, not known so long. And, yeah, and yeah, we don't know where the big switches that cancel everything are. We don't know whether we made, made it past several of them or we've not hit one yet. Mm -hmm. What is always ruled out, though, is the evidence for, if you like, us, superhumans. <laughs> if you like, it's a different question. What you're looking for is the very basics of life. Yeah. A single cell, multi cell, whatever. You're very unlikely to find human life. Mm -hmm. Very unlikely. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect, I mean, I'm not thinking you're going to go there and find sharks coming around. <laughs> <laughs> But they, I mean, yeah, bacteria probably wouldn't be surprising, really, would it? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we have no other questions, then give Lynn another big round of applause. And then our next meeting is in June, June the 12th. And then after that, it's July the 11th. And then we've got another presentation in August. So come every month, please. <laughs> and thank you everyone online that attended. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, thanks. Thank you, Flynn. Thank you. Yeah, cool.